So that brings us to the question which historians have debated for a long, long time. It's a kind of, it's not a good question. And when you pose a good, a bad question, you're likely to get a bad answer. The question is, who freed the slaves? And the answer is, everybody freed the slaves. In other words, there is no one answer to that. Did Lincoln free the slaves? Did Congress free the slaves? Did the army free the slaves? Did the slaves free themselves? The answer is yes. All of the above. All of the above had something to do with the end of slavery. And it's, it's, it's pointless to say this, this one answer is correct or this answer. But nonetheless, historians have spent a lot of ink on that. Certainly, the disintegration of slavery from within was accelerating by this point where the Union Army was, but most of the South, the Union Army is not there. But certainly in western Tennessee, in eastern um, Virginia, and now in this really important plantation belt right around New Orleans, which, you know, near New Orleans is one of the big plantation areas, sugar plantations particularly. Now, th and then of course the Sea Islands, thousands of slaves are now either within Union lines or running away to Union lines, slavery is disintegrating where the Union army is present. Um, the slaves viewed the war through their own history. Naturally, that's the only way you can view it. Under slavery, slaves had come to see themselves. They had, they had sort of crafted a kind of Christian religion but based on their own experience in which the Exodus story from, of the Bible was critical to their kind of frame of mind. They had come to see themselves as a people like the ancient Israelites in the Old Testament, condemned to slavery, but one day God would will their emancipation. Just as Moses led uh, the Israelites out of slavery, somehow they would get out. And the, the, the outbreak of the Civil War was seen by them as God's will finally appearing to bring about the end of slavery. It didn't matter what Lincoln said. It didn't matter what General said. This was the course of, of events. The Civil War would be the vehicle for their emancipation. And on a more practical level, as I said last time, they realized that the presence of the Union Army destroys the coercive power of the planter class, especially because by this time, more and more plantations, and we'll talk about this right after the break, are under the control of women. As men are drawn off to the army, it leaves in charge women or very elderly or infirm men, and the power, even on individual plantations, even away from Union forces, the power is shifting because um, slaves feel more and more capable to, of challenging the um, challenging the authority on the plantation. Now, some people say, why wasn't there a slave rebellion, an outright slave rebellion during the war? Well, that was the worst time to have a slave. The South was an armed camp. There were armies everywhere. That was not the time to have a violent uprising. But slaves chose other ways, running away, helping the Union Army, enlisting in the army when they finally had the chance, uh, as we will see. Um, and when the Union Army appears, as I say, in, in southern Louisiana, you have a little sense, by the way, if you saw 12 Years a Slave, of how brutal slavery was in, in that part of Louisiana. Um, and slaves uh, turned the tables. For, the Union Army appeared. They, in one plantation, they set up a gallows out and said, this is for you, master, unless you leave, you know? that You can leave, but if not, this is what's happening. They drove off over overseers. According to a newspaper, one slave, quote, went straight to his master's chamber, dressed himself in his best clothes, put on his watch and chain, took his stick, and returning to the parlor, informed his master that for the future he might drive his own coach. That's from a Louisiana newspaper. So. Whatever the, U the Union government said in terms of policy, this is what is happening on the ground. So that's one factor in the changing policy towards slavery. Another is the growing influence of the radical Republicans. 
Because from, remember, the radicals have been saying from the beginning of the war, you cannot win the war as a conventional war. It must become a war against slavery. You must make a target of the underlying infrastructure of the southern economy. It is slavery that is enabling them to keep these armies in the field. And so that must become a target. Now, at the beginning, as it, most people said, no, no, I don't, I don't know about that. But increasingly, the lack of military success exalts or you know, it, it, um, it increases the power of the radicals, because they have a plan. They have an alternative. The policy is not working. Somebody needs, has to come forward with another policy, and they have one. So more and more people are listening to them. From the beginning of the war, the radicals are pressing for emancipation and the enlistment of blacks in the Union Army, black men in the Union Army, and after a while, not at the beginning, as we'll see, black suffrage. That is, in a post-war South, black men need to have the right to vote. That's not on the agenda in 1862, but it will come later on. Thaddeus Stevens, in September 1862, um, says in Congress, it is plain that nothing approaching the present policy will subdue the rebels. Whether we shall find anybody with a sufficient grasp of mind and sufficient moral courage to treat this as a radical revolution and to remodel our institutions, I doubt. But that's the radical vision, you see. Make this a radical revolution and remodel our institutions. Make this a different country. Forget about restoring the old union. This is the opportunity to turn this into, as Stevens would later say, into a true republic a republic without slavery, and for Stevens, without racism. Try to fulfill the ideals of the revolution 80 years, uh, 90 years after it had taken place. So that's the radical vision in a very small nutshell. Now, Lincoln was not a radical. Lincoln never claimed to be a radical. But he was on good terms with many of them, and he understood that the radicals represented a significant part of northern public opinion. And one at one point, when a bunch of radicals from Missouri came to bother Lincoln about the terrible situation in Missouri, which nobody could solve, after they left, according to his secretary, John Hay, who kept a diary, Lincoln said, these, these guys are devils, but they're devils facing Zion word. Devils facing Zion word. In other words, he didn't get along with them that well, but they are actually, he understood that he and they were heading in the same direction. They were devils, but they were heading toward heaven or something. Um, supposedly, he told Charles Sumner at the beginning of 1862, there's only six weeks between us. There's only six weeks. I'm six weeks behind you. You are advocating things six weeks from now, they may happen. I don't know if that's completely true. Sumner later claimed that was said. But Lincoln, as we've said, had to balance all sorts of impulses and factions. He had to keep the so-called war Democrats loyal to the war effort, who were not for emancipation, but were strongly for preserving the Union. The border states, although the influence of the border is waning as, uh, as 1862 goes along, and it's clear that they're now, there's no way they're going to leave the Union as the war heads further and further into the South. Um, Lincoln was on good personal terms with Charles Sumner, um, with Owen Lovejoy. So, um, you know, so he, the, the, the relationship between Lincoln and the radicals is very complicated, sometimes very testy, and they criticized him a lot. But Lincoln is, uh, this may not be the most, the highest praise, but he was a party man. He was a Republican. He understood the balance of power in the Republican Party and that the radicals were an important part of that, and you could not just break, them, break with them or push them off to the side. So, all right, the failure of military efforts, the rising pressure of the radicals, the, decrease, the decreasing importance of the border, the growing disintegration of slavery on the ground, all these things are making the old policy just um, untenable anymore as the summer of 1862 uh, rolls along.